Thank you very much for the introduction. My name is Jia Xing Guan, and today I'll be talking about our work, Simple Schemes in a Bounded Storage Model. This is joint work with Mark Gendry. Both of us are from Princeton University. So I'm going to start off the talk with a quote from Joe Killian in year 1988. Cryptographers seldom sleep well, and their careers are frequently based on very precise, complexly theoretic assumptions, which could be shattered the next morning. I don't know if it's true for you guys, but sometimes I do have trouble falling asleep, although maybe not of this reason. Uh, but anyhow, it is true that traditionally when we build crypto primitives, we're basing the security of the crypto primitives on some complexity assumptions. For example, maybe factoring is hard, or maybe discrete log is hard, or maybe the hardness of LWE. However, for some reason, if maybe, for example, with the existence of a, of a quantum computer, we're able to actually break discrete law, then cons consequently, the security of our crypto primitives will be broken as well. And therefore, the question is, is there any way that we can actually have some good sleeps without using any maybe sleeping aids or visiting a psychiatrist? Or in other words, can we build crypto primitives without any complexity assumptions? Well, of course, there's the naive, uh, naive solution of the OTP, but if, is there anything more sophisticated that we can build? It turns out that the answer is yes. So in 1992, Yuri Mora gave out the concept of a bounded storage model under which such, uh, such pr security proofs are actually possible. So what is the bounded storage model? So traditionally, in cryptography, when we talk about an adversary, we need to somehow bound the adversary's computational resources. And there are mainly two directions, uh, namely the two dimensions are time and space. So traditionally, the adversary is bounded by time. The adversary has only a certain amount of time that he can use to, uh, to execute his algorithm. So usually we talk about the efficient algorithm that needs to be finished in poly -N. However, in a bounded storage model, the adversary can have as much time as he wants. He can run the code forever. However, there is a bound on the amount of memory used by the adversary. And in this specific model, uh, it, is, it is bounded by a fixed polynomial P of N. So in this talk, you can think about P of N being on the scale of N squared. So, what is the intuition behind the bounded storage model? The idea is that the two honest parties, they exchange so much information that for an adversary here with a bounded storage, you cannot possibly write down all of the information being, uh, being transmitted. So, in addition, so it turns out that in this model, it's actually possible for us to give unconditional proofs without any complexity assumptions. In addition to that, the bounded storage model also guarantees everlasting security. What does that mean? So for example, Alice is sending some encrypted message to Bob today using RSA encryption with uh, secure parameters. And unfortunately, there is an eavesdropper, Eve, who intercepts the message. Well, because it's using secure setup of the RSA, RSA parameters, Eve, of course, could not see what's the, what's the actual message. However, Eve could just make a copy of the message, and then Eve wait and wait and wait until 50 years later, he actually get access to a quantum computer. And he used that quantum computer to break, the, to actually factor the RSA modulus, and then he will be, be able to decrypt the message and somehow figure out that it was actually some funny cat picture from 50 years ago. So however, for the bounded storage model, there is no such concern, because at the time that the conversation happened, the adversary has not enough space to possibly write down the entire, uh, ent uh, ent uh, entire transcript of the, of the conversation. So, uh, so in a bounded storage model, we can actually achieve everlasting security. So with all that said, you might be wondering what might be one possible construction of, uh, of a protocol in a bounded storage model. So actually, most of the previous work in a bounded storage model is based on uh, the birthday paradox, and we will look at an example of a key agreement protocol which is proposed by Yuri Mora in the original paper, which is based on the birthday paradox. So there's Alice and Bob, they want to achieve a key agreement protocol. In other words, they want to output a key, uh, a shared key. And in the bounded storage model, in the original model, we assume that there is a public, uh, public source that is broadcasting random string. You can think about it as there is a long random string, and there is some guy sitting in front of a radio station reading out the bits one by one. And Alice and Bob and all the other parties in the game are just sitting in front of the radio and listening to the broadcast, and you can write down what the bits you want to write down. But once, uh, once the broadcast is over, you cannot, uh, you cannot li listen to it again, uh, in addition to what you, what, uh, uh, like, besides what you've written down. So here we have a random string, which is n squared bits long, where n is the uh, security parameter. 
So here uh, I give an example of where n equals to 4. We have a 16-bit uh, length string. So what Alice is going to do, he's going to pick n random indices out of these 16 positions. In this case, we pick four indices out of these 15, 16 positions. And then you're going to write down the corresponding bits at those locations. In this case, where Alice is going to write down the first bit, seventh bit, 12th, and 15th bit of the random string. And Bob is going to do the same, except that Bob has his own secret, uh, secret set of these random indices. And then the broadcast is gone. You, only, you can only look at what's written down. You cannot consult the string again. So to initiate the key agreement protocol, Alice will just simply send over her own secret set of the random indices to, over to Bob. And Bob is just going to compute the intersection between the two secret set of indices. And by the birthday paradox, with, with a constant probability, these two sets are going to have something in the intersection. And in this case, it's the index 7. And hence, Bob just sends back the index 7, and Alice and Bob will just output the seventh bit in the common random string as their shared key. Notice that for an adversary, if, uh, if the adversary wants to uh, output the key with probability 1, the adversary has to write down all the n square bit strings. If the adversary only has access to a small portion of these n square, of these n square bits, the information that, that the adversary has about the final shared key is very limited. We point out there are some issues with this game. First of all, it succeeds only with a constant probability. If there's nothing in, inter uh, in, in the intersection of these two sets, we either need to repeat or we need to somehow increase the two parties' uh, storage in order, to, in order to increase the probability of, of having an intersection. Secondly, actually to store all of these indices, you require more than O n space. You require actually big O of n log n space which sort of decreases the gap between the adversary and the honest parties. Well, this can be solved using pairwise independent functions, but this adds on to the complexity of the scheme built upon this. And lastly, notice that when the broadcast is going on, an adversary can always make a guess for the final index that's going to be chosen by Alice and Bob and just record a bit at that location. Notice that the adversary can guess the index correctly with probably 1 over n squared, which is non-negligible. So in order to make it actually secure, uh, another privacy amplification step is applied, also adding on to the complexity of the scheme built upon this protocol. So as a result, previously in the bounded storage model, all, all of these constructions are based on the birthday paradox. We have a key agreement scheme, scheme which has imperfect correctness. And uh, the best known results for big commitment and, obvious, uh, and OT protocols are based on a previous result by Yan Zong Ding et al. in 2006. And the result is that uh, they have a five-message protocol for OT, and which leads to a five-message big commitment scheme. In our work, however, we first show that there is a key agreement protocol which achieves perfect correctness, as opposed to imperfect correctness before, as well as we demonstrate a big commitment scheme that is one message and an OT protocol that it only takes two messages. Notice that one message and two messages are round optimal for bit commitment and OT, respectively. Our, all of our constructions rely on something very different from the birthday paradox. In fact, we rely on the recent, recent lower bound in parity learning proved by Ron Raz in 2017. So what is that lower bound about? So let's, let's gonna take a few minutes and look at that. So now let's do have an exercise just so that, so that you don't feel sleepy. So I have some string, say k, k, the string k has five bits, and each of the bits is represented by k1 all the way up to k5. All right, in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you a few equations, and at the end, you, you need to tell me what k is, okay? Cool, so here's the first equation, second equation, third, fourth, fifth. Okay, now tell me what k is. It's, it's kind, of, kind, of, kind of hard, right? Well, zero is actually not, not a correct answer. But so, however, it's actually really straightforward. If I just give all of these, these equations to you on the same screen, you can just use Gaussian elimination to figure out that k is actually 11001. However, the idea is that when I'm streaming these equations to you, you don't have enough memory to write down all these equations so that uh, there's a very limited amount of information you know about the key k. So let's formalize this a little bit. So first of all, we expand out these equations by adding the, by adding the missing, missing terms with coefficients of zero. And then we figure out that we can actually write them as an inner product between a vector, uh, a, a vector and the secret vector k, okay? So we're gonna represent these vectors, call them r's, 
And for the inner product values, we'll just call them A's. So now, essentially, what we have is just a whole bunch of equations in the form of Ri inner product with K gives us Ai mod 2. If we further rewrite it, we're going to rewrite it. We essentially, for each equation, it can be represented by a pair of values, which is a vector R and a, single, and a numerical value Ai, which is just the inner product between Ri and the K. So here, we're, uh, we're using the dot product to represent the inner product here, and everything is carried out mod 2, so that, uh, bear that in mind, so plus will actually be just XOR. Now, let's actually jump to the, to the actual lower bound. So it's defined through a game. So here's the adversary. The adversary has a space uh, which is cn squared for some small constant c. Here we actually require that c to be uh, smaller than 1, because if the c is actually greater than 1, you can actually just write everything down. So as a challenger, we have a secret key k value that is hidden from the adversary. So we're going to send over to the adversary a whole bunch of these equations that you've just seen, it's represented by these pair of ri and ai values. Actually, we're going to send over m pairs of these values. And at the end, the adversary needs to make a guess for a k. What RAS has proved is that as long as the number of queries we've sent is less than or equal to 2 to the alpha n, where alpha is a value dependent on the constant c, in other words, as long as we have less than exponential, less than exponential number of, number of pair, these pairs or these equations, the probability that the adversary is able to guess the key k correctly is exponentially small. That directly gives us an encryption scheme, which is also put forward by Ras in his paper. So if Alex and Bob wants to encrypt the message, uh, they already have a shared key k, and if Alice wants to encrypt a message m, all that Alice needs to do is to sample a random r and just mask the message with the inner product of r and k. And to decrypt, it's very straightforward. Bob reproduces the inner product and masks the original message, uh, or masks the cipher text with the inner product. Notice that here, plus is actually XOR, so it's sort of like one-time path. You XOR it twice, you get back to the original message. In fact, we can repeat this process many times. Alice can send as many of these messages as you want, as long as it's uh, less than exponential. So one thing to, mention, uh, to note that about this, um, this scheme is that it's additively homomorphic. If we have two encryptions, R1, R0A0 and R1A1, if we add them together, notice that the second term, A0 plus A1, actually expands out to this, which actually turns out to be an encryption of M0 plus M1. And the security of this scheme is directly follows from the lower bound that RAS has just, uh, just proved. Essentially, for, we can construct an adversary that breaks the parity learning game from the adversary that breaks the CPU security of this scheme. So moving on to that, uh, for today's talk, we'll be focusing on introducing our bit commitment scheme uh, in our paper. And with this directly follows from the encryption scheme that we have just seen. So what's a bit commitment scheme? There are two parties, the committer and the verifier. The committer has a bit B, and they're going to sort of have some uh, initial com uh, conversation between committer and verifier, which we refer to as a commit phase. And later on, at a later point of time, the committer is going to send over a revealing of the bit B. Well, it usually consists of the bit B and some auxiliary data that allows the verifier to verify if, the, uh, if, the, if it's a valid commitment. And then we call this reveal phase. And then verifier is going to output either accept or reject based on the commitment and the revealing that it has received. There are two desired security properties of a big commitment scheme. So first of all, uh, we require a hiding property. Essentially, we say that after the commitment phase, the verifier should have no idea of what the hidden bit B is. Well, this is sort of straightforward. For the binding property, it's slightly different. We need to have a security game to define this. So the committer is going to carry out the, the commitment phase just as usual uh, with the verifier. And at the end of the commitment phase, instead of revealing a single, a single bit B, the committer is asked to make two revealings. Essentially, the committer needs to reveal to both 0 and 1. And the verifier is going to, ver verifier is going to verify these, uh, these two revealings and output accept or reject. We say uh, the committer wins the game if it's able to trick the verifier into accepting both openings of the commitment. Well, then, the game is, then we say the commi commitment scheme is binding if Alice, uh, as the committer, cannot produce such two openings of the, of the same commitment. All right. So now let's take a look at our actual construction. 
We call it take one here because here, bear in mind that in this construction, we're only, uh, it's only secure against an honest but curious committer. In other words, the committer will abide to our protocol, but will try to get as many information as he wants. So Alice is a bit B, and to set up, Alice will just have a sample random secret key K. And in the very beginning, Alice is just going to send over a whole bunch of these equations uh, that look like this. Now actually think about what are these. If you look at each row, essentially we have a random vector R and an in the, in the product between this random vector and the key K. In parentheses, X root with zero. So in other words, each of these, uh, these rows is an encryption of zero using the key K, uh, using the encryption scheme that we've just talked about. So now we have a whole bunch of encryptions of zeros. Now, once we have those encryptions of zeros, what Bob is going to do is going to take a random subset sum of these encryptions of zeros. So how is Bob going to do that? Essentially, you're going to have a, have a random bit for each row. And if the bit is 1, you just add that row, uh, you just add that row to, your ran, to your running subset sum. So in this case, if we let x to be the subset sum of the r's and y, y to be the subset sum of the a's, this is what x and y will look like. All right? And if we, then, if we actually then look at uh, the, all of these, these, these conversations together, all of these, uh, these messages, we can actually, if we put the R's, the R, R vectors, into the rows of a, of a single matrix, we can rewrite this whole thing in a matrix form. Essentially, we just send over two matrices, uh, not two matrices, a matrix R, and a column vector A, which is equal to R times K. Correspondingly, we're able to rewrite uh, the subset sums in that J is now a row vector, and X is just equal to J times R, and Y is equal to J times A. So J is a row vector. You can think about as J, essentially, J tells you which rows of the, from the R matrices should you select and sum up. Once we have that, the com the, to finish up the commitment, uh, to finish up the commitment, to actually commit to bit B, Alice just needs to send over an encryption of the bit B using the same key K. Later on, to reveal the commitment, Alice will simply reveal the bit B and the secret key K used for all the previous encryptions. And to verify, Bob will check two things. First of all, that indeed, why, why is an why, uh, the, the secret key K prime provided by Alice indeed decrypts Y uh, to zero. That's what the first equation is essentially saying. And the second equation is just saying that using the secret key K prime provided by the, uh, by, by the committer, actually you're able to decrypt the commitment back to the bit B prime. So now let's take a look at why the scheme is hiding. So essentially for hiding, we require that at the end of the commitment phase, the adversary has no idea of what the bit B is. This is actually trivial because notice that all that Alice has, all that Alice has sent is just a couple of encryptions of zero followed by an encryption of B. Because the encryption scheme is secure, well, the value of B is hidden from the adversary because B is encrypted using K. All right? So for the binding, it's slightly uh, more complicated, but uh, let's take a look. So so here we're going to run the same commitment phase again. And at the end, the adversary needs to provide two openings, essentially 0 and 1, open to both 0 and 1 with the two different keys, k0 prime and k1 prime. And uh, Bobby is going to check two things, that both, commitment, uh, both openings are valid. To check the first openings are valid, Bob uh, think about these two things, checks that y is equal to x times k0 prime, and a prime is equal to r prime times k0 prime. These are just like, I'm just rewriting the, the conditions that Bob needs to check. And Bob needs to check again that the opening for one is also valid, which looks like this. OK. So now think about, because, we, because the adversary only wins when both of these conditions are, when all of these four conditions are met, if we write the two of the, two of the first equations together and combine the, the, second, the two second equations together, we actually have these. First of all, from, uh, from the second rows of these two boxes, we know that k0 prime is not equal to k1 prime. And from the first rows, we know that x times the difference between k0 prime and k1 prime is actually 0. Well, what is this? This is actually equivalent as saying that we have some linear equation x times k prime equal, not e equal to 0, and you need to find some non-trivial root for that linear, uh, linear equation. Now, think about why this, uh, this could be difficult for, for, for the committer to do. 
uh, we set our security parameters for m to be equal to 2n. So in that way, r is a matrix of 2n times n, which is a tall matrix. Because it's tall, with very high probability, r is full rank. And if r is full rank, we can see that x actually appears random if you don't know about j. And therefore, from the view of the committer, you need to submit some k prime that satisfies a random uh, linear equation, which you can do no better than a random guess, which you can essentially you pass with probably a half. So in this way, the committer is able to catch the, uh, the, the verifier is able to catch the committer with probably a half. If we want to further boost this probability, it's very straightforward. Instead of keeping one single subset sums, you keep multiple of these subset sums, and uh, therefore you will be able to catch, uh, catch, the, uh, catch a cheating committer with a higher probability. So however, this, this, all these things are based on the fact that the committer is actually honest but curious. If the committer is actually malicious, he can actually generate the random the matrix R not randomly. He can deliberately choose the random the matrix R to be of low rank, and therefore X will just not no longer appear random to him, and he can easily find a K prime such that the equation holds. So to, to counter that, we only need to make some very small modifications to our scheme. So now instead of having one single key, Alice is gonna have two different keys of the different of different lengths, a secret key K and a secret key S. And in the beginning, Alice is going to still stream over a whole bunch of encryptions, but this time no longer of encryptions of zero, but rather of the bits in S. And after the streaming is over, and Bobby is going to still do the same thing, he's going to take a subset sum of these uh, streamings of encryptions. And at the end of the streaming, Alice is going to send over the key K used for to encrypt all of, the, all of these encryptions before. And Bobby is going to do some simple math on his end. Given the value, uh, given, the, given K, and the x and y that he has recorded before, he's gonna calculate z equal to y minus x times k. Uh, trust me, if you do the math, you will get that is equal to j times s. All right? And uh, Bob no longer needs to memorize what x and y is. All that Bob needs to know is j and z. And to commit a message, it's still the same old trick. You encrypt a bit b using the secret key, but this time no longer using k, because of course you already sent over k. You encrypt it using the secret key s, which you haven't sent to the, to the verifier yet. And to open the commitment, it's still the same old trick. You reveal the bit together with the secret key that's used to encrypt the bit. So now, uh, what, Bo what Bobby is gonna check is that essentially, when, it's essentially that the secret key s, s prime sent by Alice, indeed decrypts z to an encryption of zero. And secondly, that indeed S prime is the key used to encrypt the bit B prime. So notice this is kind of similar to the previous scheme, but notice that uh, recall that in, the, in our take one, at the end of the commitment phase, what Bob has recorded is Y and X such that Y is an encryption of zero under the key K. And here, at the end of this commitment phase, what Bob has recorded is J and Z, where Z is an encryption of zero under the secret key S. However, there's a crucial difference here, is that notice that X, if the, if, if the adversary is actually malicious, X would not be random to the view of the committer. However, here, you consider the value J, J is entirely chosen by the committer, uh, by the verifier, and therefore, even if the malicious, even if the committer is malicious, J would be completely random to the view of the committer. Therefore, in this case, we achieve binding, uh, a binding property even against malicious uh, adversaries, uh, malicious committers. So lastly, to sum up, uh, in, our, in our paper, we present three schemes, essentially a key agreement protocol, a big commitment scheme, and OT protocol. We stress that our big commitment scheme and OT protocol are both round optimal, and we want to stress that all of our constructions are really simple, as we have just seen. Uh, they, don't have, they don't have much complicated operations in there. So this brings us to the, to the future work. We suspect that, and we're really confident that it's actually possible for us to build more sophisticated uh, crypto primitives from this parity learning lower bound. So we encourage you guys to look at our paper, uh, read our constructions of these three schemes, and think about if it's possible to maybe build IO or NIX from this uh, parity learning lower bound. And that's our talk. Thank you. Yes, Yuval.
Yes. The adversary is still a computational inbounded. The only uh, restriction that we pose is that the adversary uh, has the space bound. And I'm asking about the simulator. So a simulator? Yeah, so, so the, the previous construction, usually you require that uh, any adversary can be simulated uh, where the resources of the simulator are polynomial in those of the adversary. And the previous constructions of OT in the bounded storage model only satisfy the weaker requirement mm -hmm. that even if the adversary is efficient, the simulator still needs to be computationally unbounded. So my question is whether your scheme avoids this caveat. Yes, so uh, for our commitment scheme and the key women protocol, it's secure even if the simulator has the same uh, memory space as the adversary. So in other words, it's uh, secure for a, a bounded simulator. Yeah, the running time is always unbounded, but rather we're talking about the space here. However, for the OT protocol, uh, it's slightly trickier because uh, we want to show that uh, essentially it's for, uh, for the OT protocol, it's essentially for the, uh, for the sender security. We want to show that the receiver only knows one of these two bits. And there, we either need to assume that the, that the simulator has, uh, has access to the, to the receiver's secret coins, or we, can, or we need to assume that the, uh, that, the uh, that the simulator has the power to rewind, rewind the receiver to run it over and over again. Because, in, it is, because that's the only way that we can, we're able to find out what actual bit that is interesting that we can simulate it. Yeah. Uh, would you have a question? Uh, any more questions? Again. Just a quick technical question about the model. So when you assume the attacker's memory is bounded, how fine granular is it like you kind of assume, so how short should be the, so you know, you send a message, he has this memory, you send the message, he has this memory, um, you know, how long are those messages? Can your messages be like, you know, I'm just trying to see is it like, does your protocol critically use the fact that after every kind of short message he has to condense to n square, um, or can yeah. the messages be kind of long? Yeah, you can think about that the, the whole message is sent over as a bit stream, and you can read each bit only once. And in terms of uh, practical security, uh, if you think about if you think about an um, say honest user with gigabytes of memory, it turns out that it's like 10 to the eight, 10 to the eighth bytes, uh, 10 to the ninth bytes. Uh, it turns out the adversary will will need some somewhere up to 10 to the 18 bytes, which is roughly, I don't know, thousands of terabytes, which is definitely seems more intimidating than the gigabytes of memory needed by the, uh, by the, by the non-honest parties. So follow-ups to us, uh, paper, to us the original work showed that uh, these low bounds for, for parties actually hold for many other functions, like basically everything that is hard to learn. Uh, could, could you find out? I can I hear you. Yeah, so now we know after follow-ups uh, for the original paper that parity is not just a special case. There are many other cases that will be hard, like uh, that you can prove uh, time memory trade-offs. So does these problems uh, give you more power to, to construct uh, primitives or uh, you just stop at parities? Yeah, we haven't checked uh, the follow-up work to the, you were talking about the follow-up work to the original uh, time space lore. Yeah, I paper. think that there are already like four papers out or something. Like yeah, that. we haven't checked, uh, checked that, but we, uh, we, uh, we suspect that it would make, that would essentially would give us more power in constructing our schemes. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, are there any more questions? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great talk. Um, can you, uh, um, is your OT protocol uh, compatible with uh, OT extensions, or is it even necessary to consider that? Compared to o what, OT extensions, or? OT extension protocol. Uh, of this transfer protocol? Or? Yes. So how our becoming scheme uh, extends to the OT protocol? Yes. Is it okay. Yeah, actually, uh, I can explain it like, within like, a few sentences. Our OT protocol is very straightforward. Notice that our big commitment scheme, essentially your commitment is just an encryption. And therefore, our big commitment, sch big commitment scheme is actually additive homomorphic as well your, uh, in terms of your commitment tag. And our OT protocol is just that the receiver is just going to commit the bit that you're interested in to the sender. And the sender is just going to use the additive homomorphism of the, of the commitment message to calculate the two cipher tags for b times x0 and 1 minus b times x1. And notice that if you decrypt the envelopes, you actually get xb and 0 times x1 minus b. So that's like the general idea. The uh, actual construction, you can take a look at that in our paper together with the proofs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's thank the speaker again.